Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu Alaikum. Kindly like, share and subscribe to my channel and kindly send durood to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim innaka Hamidum Majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammadin kama barik ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim innaka Hamidum Majid. Start of chapter 2 from the historical past. It is not difficult to reproduce a further dozen or more eulogies by the admirers and critics of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Despite all their objectivity, jaundiced minds can always conjure up some aspersions. Let me take my readers deep down in past history. It was Friday the 8th of May 1840, that is about 150 years ago, at a time when it was a sacrilege to say anything good about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Christian West was trained to hate the man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his religion the same way as dogs were at one stage trained in my country to hate all black people at that time in history Thomas Carlyle one, one of, of the, the greatest thinkers of the past century delivered a series of lectures under the theme heroes and hero worship Developed Sickness Carlyle exposed this blind prejudice of his people at the beginning of his talk. He made reference to one of the literary giants, a Dutch scholar and statesman by the name of Hugo Grotius, who had written a bitter and abusive invective against the Prophet of Islam. He had falsely charged that the Holy Prophet had trained pigeons to pick out peas from his ears, so that he could by his trick bluff his people that the Holy Ghost in the shape of a dove was revealing God's revelation to him, which he then had them recorded in his Bible, the Qur'an. Perhaps Grotius was inspired into this fairy tale from his reading of his own holy scriptures. Then Jesus, when he had been baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. The Holy Bible, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 Where's the authority? Pocock, another respected intellectual of the time, like Doubting Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 25, wanted proof about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the pigeons and the peas. Grotius answered that there was no proof. He just felt like inventing this story for his audience. To him and his audience, the pigeons and peas theory was more plausible than that of the archangel dictating to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These falsities wrung the heart of Carlyle. He cried, The lies which well-meaning zeal has heaped round this man are disgraceful to ourselves only. Thomas Carlyle The Hero Prophet Carlyle was a man of genius and God gifted him with the art of articulation. In his own way, he wanted to put the record straight. He planned to deliver a lecture and he chose a very provocative topic, the hero as prophet, and he chose his hero prophet to be the most malign man of his time, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not Moses, David, Solomon or Jesus, but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To placate his overwhelming Anglican belonging to the Church of England, fellow countrymen, he apologized. As there is no danger of our becoming any of us Mahometans, I mean to say all the good of him I justly can. In other words, he as well as his elite audience were free from the fear of converting to Islam and could take a chance in paying some compliments to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If he had any fear regarding the strength of their faith, he would not have taken that chance. In an era of hatred and spite towards everything Islamic and to an audience full of skepticism and cynicism, Carlyle unfolded many a glowing truth about his hero, 
Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To the praiseworthy, indeed be praised, for that is what the very name Muhammad means, the praised one, the praiseworthy. There are times when Carlyle uses words and expressions which might not be too pleasing to the believing Muslim, but one has to forgive him as he was walking a cultural tightrope and he succeeded eminently. He paid our hero many ardent and enthusiastic tributes and defended him from the false charges and calumnies of his enemies, exactly as the Prophet had done in the case of Jesus salam and his mother salam. His Sincerity 1a. The great man's sincerity is of the kind he cannot speak of. Nay, I suppose, he is conscious rather of insincerity. For what man can walk accurately by the law or truth for one day? No, the great man does not boast himself sincere. Far from that, perhaps does not ask himself if he is so. I would say rather, his sincerity does not depend on himself. He cannot help being sincere. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 59 B. A silent, great soul. He was one of those who cannot be in earnest, whom nature herself has appointed to be sincere, while others walk in formulas and hearsays, contented enough to dwell there, this man could not screen himself in formulas. He was alone with his own soul and the reality of things. Such sincerity as we named it has in very truth something of divine. The word of such a man is a voice direct from nature's own heart. Men do and must listen to that as to nothing else. All else is wind in comparison. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 71 In his lengthy speech, Carlyle did not have the opportunity to inform his audience about the sources of his inferences. I may furnish just one incident from the life of the Prophet, an incident which reflects the highest degree of his sincerity in recording a revelation in the Holy Quran, even if it seems to reprove him for some natural and human zeal. Admonition as revealed. It was in the early days of his mission in Mecca. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was deeply engrossed in trying to invite the leaders of the pagan Quraysh to his teachings. Apparently, one of them was giving him an attentive hearing when a poor blind man by the name of Abdullah ibn Umi Maktoum tried to barge in into the discussion and wanted to draw attention to himself. The Blessed Prophet ﷺ said nothing, but a thought went through his mind. Why don't you have a little patience? Can't you see sense that because of your impatience, I might lose these customers? I believe that lesser men, sinners and saints will not be questioned for such lapses but not so for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did not God choose him and honor him with that lofty status as recorded? And most certainly thou, O Muhammad, art of most sublime and exalted character. The Noble Qur'an, Surah Kalam, Chapter 68, Verse 4 He frowned. Whilst in the midst of the conversation with his pagan fellow tribesmen, God Almighty sends Gabriel, the angel of revelation, with this admonition. The Prophet frowned and turned away. Because there came to him the blind man interrupting. But what could tell thee that perchance he might grow in spiritual understanding? أَوْ يَتْزَكَّرُوا فَتَنْفَعَهُ الذِّكْرَىٰ Or that he might receive admonition and the teaching might profit him. The Noble Qur'an Surah Abasa Chapter 80 Verses 1-4 to The Holy Prophet wasallam had naturally disliked the interruption. Perhaps the poor man's feelings were hurt but he whose gentle heart ever sympathized with the poor and the afflicted got new light revelation from his Lord and without the least hesitation he immediately published it for all eternity. Subsequently, every time he met this blind man, he received him graciously and thanked him that on his account 
the Lord had remembered him. During Muhammad's absences from Medina, the blind man was made the governor of the city twice. Such was the sincerity and gratitude of Carlyle's hero prophet. His Fidelity 2. It is a boundless favor. He never forgot this good Khadija. Long afterwards, Aisha, his young favorite wife, a woman who indeed distinguished herself among the Muslims by all manners of qualities, through her whole long life, this young brilliant Aisha was one day questioning him. Now am not I better than Khadija? She was a widow, old, and had lost her looks. You love me better than you did her? No, by Allah, answered Muhammad. No, by Allah. She believed in me when none else would believe. In the whole world, I had but one friend, and she was that. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 76 It would have been easier to repel the temptation of the devil than to succumb to the ego of a young, loving, brilliant and beautiful wife like Lady Aisha Siddiqa radiyallahu ta'ala anha. Why not let her hear the soft, soothing balm of flattery? It will not harm anyone. Even the soul of Bibi Khatija, the mother of the faithful, would look light-heartedly at the ruse. There is no shaming, no innocent white lies with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Traits of this kind show us the genuine man, brother of us all, brought visible through 14 centuries, the veritable son of our common mother. Al-Amin, the faithful. 3a. A man of truth and fidelity, true in what he did, in what he spake and thought. They noted that he always meant something, a man rather taciturn in speech, silent when there was nothing to be said, but pertinent, wise, sincere when he did speak, always throwing light on the matter. This is the only sort of speech worth speaking. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 69. B. Muhammad naturally gave offense to the Quraysh, keepers of the Kaaba, superintendents of the idols. One or two men of influence had joined him. The thing spread slowly, but it was spreading. Naturally, he gave offense to everybody. The Jews hated the Prophet, the Christians hated the Prophet, the Mushriks, the polytheists hated the Prophet, and the Munafikin, the hypocrites, hated the Prophet. It is the nature of falsehood to hate the truth. Light eliminates darkness, but darkness does not take kindly to light. C. Not a mealy-mouthed man. A candid ferocity, if the case call for it, is in him. He does not mince matters. The war of Tubak is a thing he often speaks of. His men refused, many of them, to march on that occasion. Pleaded the heat of the weather, the harvest, and so forth. He can never forget that. Your harvest? It lasts for a day. What will become of your harvest through all eternity? Hot weather? Yes, it was hot, but hell will be hotter. Sometimes the rough sarcasm turns up. He says to the unbelievers, Ye shall not have short weight. Heroes and Hero Worship, pages 95 and 96. Remember, Thomas Carlyle uttered these words and many more to a shocked and bewildered Christian audience in England a hundred and fifty years ago. History did not record for us the lively arguments and debates which his lecture must naturally have caused. He kept to his promise. I mean to say all the good of him, I justly can. And he went on in his talk to defend Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam against the false charges, slander, and calumnies of his enemies. Charge of Falsity 4a. A false man found a religion? Why? A false man cannot build a brick house. If he does not know and follow truly the properties of mortar, burnt clay and what else he works in, it is no house that he makes, but a rubbish heap. It will not stand for twelve centuries to lodge a hundred and eighty millions. It will fall straight away. Speciosities are spacious. It is like a forged bank note. They get it passed out of their worthless hands. Others, not they, have to smart for it. 
nature bursts up in fire flames, French revolutions and such like, proclaiming with the terrible veracity that forged notes are forged. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 58. B. It goes greatly against the imposter theory, the fact that he lived in this entirely unexceptionable, entirely quiet and commonplace way till the heat of his years was done. He was forty before he talked of any mission from heaven. All his ambition, seemingly, had been hitherto to live an honest life, his fame the mere good opinion of neighbours that knew him. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 70. C. Ambition? What could all Arabia do for this man? With the crown of Greek Heraclius, of Persian Khosrows, and all the crowns in earth. What could they all do for him? It was not of the heaven above and of the hell beneath, all crowns and sovereignties whatsoever. Where would they in a few brief years be? To be sheikh of Mecca or Arabia, and have a bit of guilt wood put into your hand. Will that be one's salvation? I decidedly think not. We will leave it altogether, this imposter hypothesis, as not creditable, not very tolerable even, worthy chiefly of dismissal by us. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 72 and 73. Charge of Sinning 5. Faults? The greatest of faults, I should say, is to be conscious of none. Readers of the Bible above all, one would think might know better. Who is called there the man according to God's own heart? David, the Hebrew king, had fallen into sins enough, blackest crimes. There was no want of sins. And thereupon the unbelievers sneer and ask, Is this your man according to God's heart? The sneer, I must say, seems to me but a shallow one. What are faults? What are the outward details of a life? If the inner secret of it, the remorse, temptations, true, often baffled, never-ended struggle of it be forgotten? It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Of all acts, is not for a man repentance the most divine? The deadliest sin, I say, was the same supercilious consciousness of no sin. That is death, the heart so conscious is divorced from sincerity, humility, and fact, is dead. It is pure as dead dry sand is pure. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 61 Charge of the Sword The greatest crime, the greatest sin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the eyes of the Christian West is that he did not allow himself to be slaughtered, to be crucified by his enemies. He ably defended himself, his family and his followers, and finally vanquished his enemies. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam's success is the Christian gall of disappointment. He did not believe in any vicarious sacrifice for the sins of others. He believed and behaved naturally. In the state of nature, everyone has a right to defend his person and possessions and extend his hostilities to a reasonable amount of satisfaction and retaliation, says Gibbon, the master historian in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire. His struggle and victory over the forces of unbelief and evil made the editors of the Encyclopedia Britannica to exclaim Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be the most successful of all religious personalities. How can the enemies of Islam account for Muhammad's phenomenal achievements except to decry that he spread his religion at the point of the sword? He forced Islam down people's throats? 6a History makes it clear, however, that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping through the world and forcing Islam at the point of the sword upon conquered races is one of the most fantastically absurd myths that historians have ever repeated. De Lacy O'Leary in Islam at the Crossroads, London, 1923, page 8. You do not have to be a historian like O'Leary to know that the Muslims ruled Spain for 736 years. The longest the Christians ever ruled over Muslims was 500 years in Mozambique, a territory captured from an Arab governor by the name of Musa bin Baik, a name they could not properly pronounce, hence the name Mozambique. 
Even today, after five centuries of Christian overlordship, the country is still 60% Muslim. However, after eight centuries in Spain, the Muslims were totally eliminated from that country, so that not even one man was left to give the Azan, the Muslim call to prayer. If the Muslim had used force, military or economic, there would not have been any Christians left in Spain to have kicked the Muslims out. One can blame the Muslims for exploitation, if you like, but one cannot charge them with using the sword to convert Spaniards to the Islamic religion. Today, Islam is still spreading all over the world and Muslims have no sword. The Muslims were also the masters of India for a thousand years, but eventually when the subcontinent received independence in 1947, the Hindus obtained three quarters of the country and the Muslims the balance of the one quarter. Why? because the Muslims did not force Islam down the Hindus' throat. In Spain and in India, the Muslims were no paragons of virtue, yet they obeyed the Quranic injunction to the letter, La ikraha fitteen, that there be no compulsion in religion. For truth stands out distinct from error. The Noble Quran, Surah Baqarah, Chapter 2, Verse 256 the Muslim conquerors understood from this command that compulsion was incompatible with true religion because a. Religion depends on faith and will and these would be meaningless if induced by force. Force can conquer but cannot convert. b. Truth and error have been so clearly shown up by the mercy of God that there should be no doubt in the minds of any person of good will as to the fundamentals of faith. c. God's protection is continuous and his plan is always to lead us from the depths of darkness into the clearest light. Except for some eccentrics here and there, the Muslims as a whole adhere to the commandment of God in the lands over which they held sway. But what can the enemy say about countries where no single Muslim soldier had set foot? 1. Indonesia It is a fact that over a hundred million Indonesians are Muslims. Yet no conquering Muslim army ever landed on any of its over 2,000 islands. 2. Malaysia The overwhelming number of its people in this country are Muslims, yet no Muslim soldier had landed there either. 3. Africa The majority of the people on the east of Africa as far down as Mozambique, as well as the bulk of the inhabitants on the west coast of the continent are Muslims. But history does not record any invading hordes of Muslims from anywhere. What sword? Where was the sword? The Muslim trader did the job. His good conduct and moral rectitude achieved the miracle of conversion. All what you say seems inconvertible, Mr. Didat, says the Christian controversialist. But we are talking about Islam at its very beginning, the way in which your prophet converted the pagans to his faith. How did he do it if not with the sword? One against all. We can do no better than to allow Thomas Carlyle himself to defend his hero prophet against this false charge. Seven. The sword indeed. But where will you get your sword? Every new opinion at its starting is precisely in a minority of one. In one man's head alone there it dwells as yet. One man alone of the whole world believes it. There is one man against all men. That he take a sword and try to propagate with that will do little for him. You must first catch your sword. On the whole, a thing will propagate itself as it can. We do not find of the Christian religion either that it always disdained the sword when once it had got one. Charlemagne's conversion of the Saxons was not by preaching. Heroes and Hero Worship, page 80. At the age of 40, when Muhammad وسلم, declared his divine mission from heaven, there was no political party or royalty and certainly no family or tribe to back him up. His people, the Arabs, immersed in idol worship and fetishism, were not by any means a docile people. They were no easy meat. They were a subject to all kinds of fierce sincerities. One man single-handed 
to wean such a people from barbarism required nothing short of a miracle. A miracle did happen. God alone could have made Islam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to triumph through with flimsy, gossamer support, God fulfilling his promise. And have we not raised high the esteem in which thou, O Muhammad, art held? The Noble Quran, Surah Inshirah, Chapter 94, Verse 4 End of Chapter 2